Obrigado, Sasha Ribt. É um grande prazer tê-lo conosco dentro do Cyber Security Summit. O Sasha vai estar discutindo 10 horas dentro de um trem, como ele fez um controle uh, da Radio Stations da Inglaterra e vai estar debatendo como foi esse cenário. Obrigado, Sasha. Sim. Yeah. Thanks, Rafael, uh, and thanks for having me at the uh, Cybersecurity Summit Brazil. Um, so today uh, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, cybersecurity in transport and specifically in rail. So a little bit about uh, Modux. So I'm currently technical director at Modux. Uh, we were founded in 2008. Uh, we're a small technical consultancy based in the UK and we deliver a technical cybersecurity consultancy across enterprise, um, FTSE 100s, telecoms, and uh, kind of larger spaces and larger critical infrastructure across the UK. So that kind of security assessment uh, work that we do is penetration testing um, and research and that kind of you know deep dive technical investigations into whether platforms are secure or if there, there are more ways that we can recommend that platforms can be secured against real world attacks. So our capabilities as a company, so we're very often performing these red teams and real world scenarios, but we also perform a lot of uh, bespoke consultancy. So things like software development and research, and that helps us feed into Uh, what we're doing on the assessment side because we have a deeper understanding of the technologies our clients are using. Uh, we tend to do very, very bespoke work. So we're not really doing kind of run of the mill web application testing. We're doing a lot of work against uh, specific technologies and kind of proprietary technologies that organizations may use. So it could be a bank ATM, it could be 4G base stations, or maybe even a ship. So our approach is that we're doing high quality work where we deeply understand the technology that the clients are using or developing. And from there, we take this real deep understanding of the technology and work alongside them in order to then give a realistic idea of if we can hack it. And our approach is that we're offensive consultants. So we're trying to break these systems and break into them and exfiltrate data where we can. So we've worked across uh, a number of pretty large engagements uh, on ships, 4G and 5G mobile infrastructure, um, oil and gas, and auto car telematics. So. We've been successful in hacking a number of uh, different kind of industries and technologies within those industries. Uh, these pictures are actually from recent engagements that we've done over the last year before uh, the recent situation hit where no one can travel. Um, so what is a realistic attack scenario? Well, it's kind of, um, we. it may be based primarily around computing and ways of breaking into computer systems, but also we're taking into account breaking into buildings and social engineering as well, so that we can give a really decent understanding to the client of if the, their systems, their platforms, their buildings, their infrastructure can be broken into. So the benefits of that is that it's Uh, focuses on high impact. So we're not really interested in whether your TLS certificates are out of date or not, uh, but we are interested in if there's a dangling system or a server on the internet that you know is going to give us access into a data center maybe. Uh, we're focusing on high risk. So once we've got onto that server, what can we do? We're looking for large amounts of data. We're looking for persistent access, and maybe we're looking for ways to pivot into an organization. And it's fully gap focused, this real world scenarios um, based way of working. So we're, we're not looking at your security controls. You'll be focused on the security controls. We're focused on the gaps. Um, and this, this way of working allows us to chain vulnerabilities as well. So the scope is always so broad that if we do find something that is going to help us in one way or another, we can use that as part of our whole attack methodology and put it in so that it makes up part of the uh, kind of a piece of the chain. 
Uh, so today I'll be talking about a piece of work that we've been doing over the last uh, year uh, with a global rail organization. So uh, this company is based across uh, the world, uh, many different countries. And um, what we proposed to them was kind of a red team assessment against the rail uh, infrastructure that they operate. So, so the way that worked is that we, we initially met with stakeholders and it was important to understand the stakeholders' requirements or what they thought their requirements were. And then we met with technical stakeholders to understand their idea of risk and their understanding of their platform. Uh, and then we kind of twisted what they thought their requirements were a little bit because obviously uh, we're there to advise and we gave them a scope that reflects real world risk and real world threats to rail and transport in uh, 2019 and 2020. And so what we came up with was uh, a red team across uh, the whole fleet of trains that they operate and uh, deep dive technical assessments of those rail fleets. So to put it simply, uh, this is what a simple train looks like once it's connected to the various data networks and train operator that's operating that train. So this is a simplified image of a standalone train. Obviously, you've got the passenger Wi-Fi that people like to connect to, uh, which should be regarded as hostile. And then you've got the operations network, things like the brakes, the TCMS, the train management systems, uh, driver advisory systems, CCTV cameras and media. Um, obviously, this is extremely simplified uh, and this uh, definitely shouldn't be uh, anything to base any kind of design work off. Um, the third party data services, um, they actually formed a critical part of the scope because very often pen tests and security assessments are scoped uh, quite acutely. And it's important in order to fully understand risk that the scope is broad enough to make sure that everything is covered that would be used in a realistic attack scenario. Um, you know, if, uh, we're, we're discounting things from the scope because of, uh, you know, pushback maybe from third parties. There's often that risk that we're going to miss something that uh, an attacker would wouldn't really care about. Uh, you know, they're not going to care about whether the third party has an NDA or not. They're just going to go for it. So it's important that we make sure we can encompass as much as possible in a, a penta scope. And uh, it's probably worth uh, pointing out now. Um, the term pen testing has kind of been changed over the years, but we like to go with the the original meaning of that term, you know, which is it's akin to hacking rather than, you know, automated scanning or anything like that. Um, so the client's initial concerns were that um, people might be able to open doors on the wrong side of the train, for example, as it pulls into the station. They might be able to modify passenger information uh, content. So, you know, say naughty messages on the screens or maybe present the wrong message to customers as they're onboarding or alighting from the train. Or maybe we could put things on passenger information screens such as bomb threats. Um, and the ideas around disabling CCTV. So uh, the client was initially concerned that if you can disable CCTV on trains, then you can uh, potentially do whatever you want on that train without any uh, repercussions or recorded evidence. But the problem with these initial concerns are that a lot of them can be done without a computer and they're based on the operating company's understanding of historical risk. So a lot of the crime that they would have been detecting and monitoring for are things that criminals and low level criminals are performing on trains such as theft and criminal damage. Trains can actually be disrupted quite easily with a few phone calls or by shouting or by pulling emergency stop uh, levers on trains. So it was important for us that we kind of try to turn the client's understanding of what risk, what their real risk is when it comes to cyber security. So attacks that you can do without computers are the standard, you know, traditional physical damage, fake emergencies, fake bomb threats, this kind of thing, uh, fighting with team uh, members, you know, of, uh, you know, staff working on the trains, 
or vandalism. And so what we did over the course of the engagement was to move the client's understanding of what risk is. And we were really interested in, can we cause mass disruption across the world on the train network? Can we harvest large amounts of passenger data? Um, can we get remote access into trains? You know, can we dial in from the internet maybe? And can we take remote control access of trains? These are the kind of things that we're going to see that are going to probably hit the news over the next few years. So it's important for us to really ensure that what we're doing is realistic to what's going to happen. The idea that we can create physical damage or physical problems on the train, that's already something we know about. So it's important that we're investigating stuff that maybe companies and within the rail and transport industry don't yet know about. So from our experience, what we expect to see across transport is really old devices, a lot of legacy equipment, a lot of embedded devices that are maybe running on cheap hardware. We so commonly see default and weak passwords, and that's often because you'll have engineers working for different companies or different teams that are sent in, and there's no real way to centrally gain access, whether that's remote access, and there's no real decent established ways of working with passwords in transport. Lack of patching, of course, because these kind of platforms really need you know, high reliability. So bringing something down in order to patch it overnight is often very difficult. Of course, we expect to see Windows XP because a lot of these platforms, these environments in transport have been designed you know, maybe 20 years ago and only been deployed recently, but they're sticking to that original design. And we expect to see poor network segregation because within an operational environment, often uh, the, this idea of trust boundary isn't a thing. You know, people want to get stuff working. And reliability is often more important than cybersecurity. So going back to this uh, simplified train network, the, the stuff I just mentioned there, that would all be in the green area. You know, we'd expect to see Windows XP on the TCMS, on the driver advisory systems, on media systems. I would expect to see default and weak passwords across a lot of this stuff. So that's the green area that we're focused on there. So what were we able to see? Well, once we're actually on a train, we can see all of the things we expect. So we were able to get access to CCTV cameras, passenger counting systems, network switches. So, you know, believe it or not, trains do run standard Ethernet, TCP, IP network switches. And then we were able to get access to more serious systems such as the DAS, the driver advisory system that gives the speed readout on a train. Uh, the ASDA, which controls the opening and closing of doors when it pulls into a station. TCMS, that's the kind of the CAN bus relay, the thing that puts sis, uh, signals onto the actual vehicle network and braking systems. So we were able to access all of these from the train network. Again, it's expected that we're able to get access to these systems, but can we get access to that train network? You know, if we can't get access onto the Ethernet TCP IP network, then I, we've got we've still got a lot of work to do. Um, yeah, these are just some screenshots and uh, our guy Lucas there with a smiley face and thumbs up. So in order to get access to the green area of the network, there's a few different ways that we might be able to do that. We might be able to open cabinets, for example, and plug a network Ethernet cable in. But in the real world, that's going to cause alarm because someone's going to come up to us and ask us, you know, what are you doing? So it's important that we try and look at the whole scope. And we say, OK, which parts of this network can we use to get into the sensitive areas of the network? Well, what about from the passenger Wi-Fi? Now, it was important for us to choose uh, the passenger Wi-Fi as a target because uh, who wouldn't want to do that? You know, if you're sat on a train and you're commuting and maybe you're a bit annoyed at the train company or you have a long commute it's you know taking you three three hours each way people are going to have a lot of time to sit and assess the security of that wireless and actually train and transport wireless networks have been assessed quite a lot over the years both by uh, white hat security consultants and people looking to cause trouble so we, we had a real challenge ahead of us if we were going to gain access to these networks through the Wi-Fi. But it was something that we felt was very important to pursue because, again, it's, it really is the real world scenario that's going to happen. So 
We can see from the previous slide, we can see that we try and reach other trains or other equipment on our train and we're blocked. You know, the firewalling has been uh, configured sufficiently to block us from gaining access to the equipment that's on our train. Uh, but we can get to Google and when we trace through to Google, we see the different hops that um, we jump through, the different routers that take us to the internet from the passenger Wi-Fi. So what we can see there is some of these hops take us onto internal private networks. So what we're interested in is can we find other devices running on internal networks? So we started to scan these other internal network ranges from the wireless on the train. And what we were able to do is, yeah, we weren't able to go from our train Wi-Fi on to the green area, you know, the maintenance and the operations network, but we were able to go from our train, our Wi-Fi, to other trains management and operation networks. So firewalling was sufficient between uh, the wireless and the operational network on our train, but it wasn't sufficient between all other trains. So then we started to scan more and we were able to exp expand our scope and get agreement from third parties um, that allowed us to really understand the full impact of what we were doing. And we were able to find many more trains across the network. And from there, we were able to get access to hundreds of trains and hundreds of operational networks on trains. So we could start seeing TCMS and Windows XP and all these kind of things that we expected to see across trains all over the world. Uh, this is a video actually showing kind of the output and the impact of how many trains we were able to reach, but I'm not sure it'll play in this current mode. Uh, oh, there we go. I've got a little play. There we go. So, got a little play button. No. Technology gremlins. So, once we'd worked out that we could go across the network, what, what were we then doing? Well, you know, we were going and validating all of these vulnerabilities that we'd seen on our train and it was important to go across every train that we could access and test for these same bugs so insecure passwords escalation you know that's going from one privileged level to another so could we get admin on boxes uh, servers you know network systems vehicular systems running on the train could we reuse passwords that we found on one train on another train? Could we use passwords that we'd found on one device on another device? And other more kind of uh, traditional bugs such as you know, remote code execution and vulnerabilities that kind of run in operating systems or firmware. Well, yeah, we were able to do that and we were able to start taking control of systems running on live trains across the world. So this is us gaining uh, root access on a TCMS. And you remember earlier I said the TCMS is the, the central kind of control system that sends uh, signals onto the CAN bus network. So we still see this same kind of stuff across uh, rail as we do in all transport. So we see embedded devices and weak passwords and the lack of patching. But what we also see is that these things are realistically exploitable from remote networks. So whether that remote network is, you know, maybe it's another train or maybe it could be a monitoring network supplied by a third party or, you know, as we start to connect uh, these vehicles more and more, it's important that we do so in a secure way. A little bit of a note on monitoring. So it was important that uh, we, we understood the level of monitoring that was uh, being performed on the attacks we were doing. And we, we did definitely see that certain attacks were being picked up during our assessment. But by the time we'd gained access into a system, all of our activity appeared as legitimate access. So any security monitoring products that were you know monitoring what we were doing, they were missing the legitimate ac activity. So they were missing the commands being run and they were missing the TCP packets going between servers and devices on that network. So it really is important that as well as monitoring for the classic attacks, you're also monitoring and logging every login to every device. 
you're monitoring connections between devices and you're monitoring legitimate appearing connections between networks too. Uh, so once we'd actually kind of proven the concept of you know, the idea that we could get access to other trains from the wireless internet, it was important for us to take it a step further. And so we started using the information that we'd gathered from the train to start probing for trains on the internet. And this is a fingerprint from an SSH connection to uh, a device on a train. And so we took that fingerprint and we scanned the whole internet, the IPv4 internet, looking for the same fingerprint on the SSH service across the internet. And we were able to find actual trains connected uh, over the internet. Um, and we'd previously obviously done security assessments against uh, these services. And so we knew ways in. And so over the internet, we were able to get access into uh, trains across across foreign countries. So what are the outcomes of this kind of work? Well, what we were able to do is we were able to go, you know, that step further uh, with the client. And instead of just saying, oh, well, we're going to pen test the train or we're going to pen test this part of the train, we really pushed to get access to third parties and really broaden the scope to make it really realistic. And because we had, you know, such good results or bad results, depending on who you are, uh, that meant that we we built the trust with the client, and we were able to, you know, advise in a way that's really going to be helpful in the rail industry and transport industry. What that's led to is buy-in from stakeholders. So the train owners, the manufacturers, are all now realizing the real impact of what can happen in an attack on transport, and they're starting to change how they're working, and they're starting to change how they're designing systems too. And it's led to a deeper understanding of the real security threats facing transport because before it was quite uh, unknown what might happen and what was possible. And we've shown that anything is possible and the impact that can happen uh, on transport networks is very real. And so hopefully this will eventually lead to improved security across rail fleets. Um, and it's important to note that what we were able to do, um, we were able to do across uh, the world. So we were able to gain access to trains running in countries in East and West uh, through shared services and through poorly configured uh, data services. Um, and these vulnerabilities are often there, but it's important to note that uh, the scope of what you're planning really is going to determine the outcomes and what you find. And if you keep the scope small, you're only going to find small things. And if you push to understand what the real risks are and just be brave enough, then we're going to find real stuff. And that's it from me. So any questions?